Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fair Trade Campaign's 2020 conference. Thank you all for joining us. Um, this is the diversity and inclusion se session, and I am Jovi Broadus. Okay, I am one of Fair Trade um, Campaign's 2020 fellows. I am also a member of the New York Fair Trade Coalition. Okay, I really want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy day you know, during a national emergency to spend some of your time with us, okay? During this session, we'll be, as I said, we will be discussing diversity, inclusion, and advocacy. Please keep in mind, there will be a question and answer period during and after the speaker's presentations. So do not forget to post all of your questions in the chats. We will get to as many as possible, okay? Um, and also, please do not forget to answer the polling question. If you're watching in a group, we really would like to know how many people are watching with you, okay? And now, let me introduce my hosts, uh, my um, co-speakers, okay? First, we have Manaprit uh, Kaura. Manaprit is a digital marketing expert and social activist. She currently serves on a board of New York City Fair Trade Coalition, a grassroots fair trade advocacy organization. She is an advocate for, false, for fostering cultural humility and sustainability through inclusive brand narratives. As a speaker, Manaprit is a thought leader in impact communication and has spoken at multiple conferences and trade shows, including World, uh, World Fair Trade Summit, Annual Fair Trade Fed Federation conferences, and uh, Alt Summit. She launched Art of a Civil Tree, a coaching co conscious business on how to maximize their impact through business development, branding, and strategic mar marketing. With a background in ventures and startup, Manaprit uses her knowledge to help businesses think of creative ways to grow and expand their influence. She brings a wealth of experience from her work with impact-driven business globally. And also our other speaker, Chad Hugh, okay? Chad has served on the w, uh, YMCA board for 11 years, okay? Chad is the USA diversity and inclusion team since 2011 and is currently the director of diversity and inclusion. In his role, he leads the DNI department's efforts to build local wise capacity to engage diverse and underdeserved community communities, co-lead implementation of YMCA of the USA's diversity and inclusion initiative networks strategies with the YUSA International Group and leads uh, integration of diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, principles and practices across Y movements. Previously, Chad served as Director of Operations and Youth Exchange for the International Branch of the YMCA of Greater New York, where he led an era of dynamic growth in youth exchange, strategic collaboration, and global education uh, programs. A strategic, effective, and passionate why professional of over 13 years. I'm sorry, I said 11. Chad no, holds a bachelor's degree. stop any time. <laughs> I, I just wanted to read it all. Okay. But <laughs> Chad is amazing. Let me just say that. I attended the last two conferences where he spoke on diversity and inclusion. Mm. And he was fantastic. So now let me just hand it over to the speakers. Awesome. Thank and I did too. want to quickly jump in. My name is Munpreet. It's pronounced... The A is pronounced like a U, so just a correction there, Munpreet, and my business name is Art of Citizenry. <laughs> Since we're doing diversity and inclusion, might as well start there, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Names are important, my friend. We've learned that together. Yes, we have. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, Chad, I would love for you uh, to go ahead and kickstart, maybe you can set some expectations on what we're going to be talking about today. Sure, absolutely. And then um, Manpreet and I are going to ask everyone's grace. As we all know, we're living and working in a challenging time. And I texted Manpreet earlier, uh, I had a rough day, if I'm being honest. So please forgive me if I'm just working through things. As you know, I work for the Y. Uh, we serve 10,000 communities across the U.S. Uh, we had <laughs> 
800 plus independently incorporated 501c3s that serve as YMCs. Um, and many of them are really, really stretching and hurting right now. Uh, and so it's been, a, it's been a challenge. That being said, Manpreet and I both believe so passionately in fair trade and the opportunity and responsibility that we all have as global citizens to ensure that when we decide where we spend our money, when we look at what socially responsible sourcing and purchasing looks like, we do look at companies that do make positive investments in our communities. It's going to become even more important when we get through this crisis, because we will, in terms of where we invest our money, what we choose to buy, who we choose to buy it from. And really, if you're not familiar, and Manpreet and I will be referencing the work of our hero, Edgar Villanueva, mm -hmm. Decolonizing Wealth. It's all about the fact that money can be healing. Money can be the antidote to injustice, inequity, systemic oppression, and challenges. When we look at it from a lens that is anti-colonial, these are really intense words, but we're going to dive into it, anti-colonial and anti-patriarchal. And with that, I'm going to turn it to my good friend, Manpreet, because she is the one who educated me on those last two big terms. <laughs> yeah, so... You know, when we were actually just getting ready for this presentation, uh, Chad and I have never met before in person, but I feel like we know each other so well. And our first conversation, when we were talking about this um, discussion and this topic, we, we do want to express that we realize this is a really difficult time. And ideally, we would be having this discussion in person, being able to do a proper in-person workshop and uh but these are the times we're in and we are trying our best between the two of us to really adapt the material to be able to bring to you some content and hopefully foster some sense of interactivity within the presentation today so we're trying our best uh, so please do bear with us but uh, we wanted to start off just by um, putting everything out in the open you know Chad you brought up some terms that we had been tossing around between the two of us which are all very loaded terms and um, I'm excited for us to really dive deep into them one of the big things that for me personally, it was very exciting to be able to talk about this topic uh, at the conference is uh, fair trade, the way it is innately uh, thought of is supposed to foster connectivity, community, diversity. Uh, and it does in many ways, but we're still lacking in so many others. And as uh, consumers become more thoughtful about where they're buying, how they're buying, who they're buying from, it's really important as fair trade advocates, business owners, and leaders for us to start being more thoughtful around the language we use and the way we talk about the work we do. Uh, fair trade is not about, uh, it's not about charity is the reality, right? And sometimes we talk about fair trade as though we are a charity and that mindset needs to shift away. Uh, and so we're gonna be talking a little bit about throughout today's discussion, how we can start thinking differently and shifting that mindset. So to start off, we were, um, sorry, I'm just gonna dive into the dimensions of diversity, which is an awesome wheel that uh, the YMCA, this is your version of it. There's multiple diversity wheel versions that have been adapted over time. So Chad, would you uh, love to start off by walking us through your version of the, the YMCA's version of the diversity wheel? Sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Manpreet. And with the caveat that the Y borrowed this with permission from Marilyn Loden, who's one of the premier diversity practitioners out there. If anyone is interested in learning more, I think you see my Twitter handle on the left. Feel free to DM me or email me and we're happy to share it with you as long as you use it with in partnership with the Y. We just want to make sure that we're supporting everyone on this wonderful journey. So three key points. First, each of us is a unique individual. There's no other human on this planet like Manpreet, like me. In the case of Manpreet, we probably could have more than one of you, that'd be great. In the case of me, there's enough. Just one of me is enough. <laughs> but we are all the cumulative sum of our lived experiences, right? The various core in the blue ring, secondary in the purple ring, and uh, organizational in the red ring dimensions of diversity make up who we all are. Second point, how we would self-identify is 
often different from how the collective of the world sees us, the two gold bricks. Example, um, you all can see my face right now. Uh, I still remember being born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, and going to college in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I went to the, I think it was the bursar's office or the registrar's office, I can't remember. And the woman looked at me and she goes, well, you know, since you're Asian, maybe you'd like to apply for this scholarship. And I remember thinking, okay, thank you. <laughs> <Then she goes. laughs> Uh, and since you're a person of color, you might be interested in the multicultural affairs office. And I started to think, and I was from Hawaii, and Hawaii, I literally naively and maybe slightly snarkily wanted to say, but don't we all have color? Like, what's this thing, right? And then she used the word that I will never forget my reaction to. And since you're a minority, and I remember thinking, all right, hold the phone. <laughs> minority that has a power dynamic to it, something just doesn't feel right. In that instance, she didn't have any malicious intent. And it's important we recognize that when we think about these different dimensions of diversity. But she was an embodiment of the collective and global context, assigning a label to me rather than allowing me to self-identify. If that question had come, I would identify as being born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. Ethnically, I don't even know what all of me is <laughs> because that's what happens for a lot of us from Hawaii. But I am from Hawaii. So I'm sharing that because for each of you on the line, think about the dimensions of diversity that you're comfortable with, that you see here. Think about the dimensions of diversity that might honestly cause you pause or challenge and embrace all of it. Yeah. Uh, what unites us is truly stronger than what divides us. And then put this as an overlay for how you interact with your work around promoting or supporting fair trade. If we are a member of the racial majority, are we aware that sometimes our efforts may come across, even with the best of intentions, of being patriarchal? We, with resources and privilege, are trying to help those without. Now, neatly, that's not anyone's fault. That's the system that was set up. That's the global context and historical context that we live in. But it's still important. Last concept, there's blank spaces in the middle. I'm just going to take a quick breath there. All right, that was nice. Uh, the blank spaces in the middle are not because of a typo or not because we got lazy. They are because no tool can capture all the different dimensions of diversity that make up who each of us is. Um, I was actually using this tool just earlier today on a call and talking about in the blank space, I think we would all right now uh, fill in in core dimensions how we, how we deal with self-isolation, right? Mm -hmm. Whether we're an introvert or extrovert. Um, I'll tell you, I'm an openly gay man and my husband is definitely an, uh, an extrovert. And I am definitely an introvert, but at the same time, how we're dealing with isolation is reversed. He's fine. I'm starting to go bonkers <laughs> because I'm not used to being here all the time. So what would you write in for your dimension? For some of us, it might be that we uh, strongly identify with a specific geographic region tied to a culture, so mixtures of the two uh, and whatnot. Um, the only other thing that I would say relative to this is see this as a lens for when we define equity coming up and when we really talk about looking at how we have to be self-aware of how we and our efforts and our intentions, regardless of motivation sometimes, could be seen by the global context that we're interacting with when we think about fair trade. Um, and if I can be really blunt, and Manpreet and I were talking about this, why? Why yeah. is fair trade important to each of us? Yeah. Does it feel good? I was telling Manpreet, when I buy my Honest Tea, which is a fair trade certified product, and I go walk around telling everybody in my office, look, fair trade, I have stickers all over my desk. Is that because I want to feel good? Because I want to feel like I'm helping? Because I want to show off that I'm socially conscious because it's hip and cool and down? Mm -hmm. Or is it because I actually want to invest in bettering this world? Ask yeah. yourself, what is that? Not right or wrong, but be aware. So we can start from a sense of reality and self-awareness and build from there. Yeah. And um, I do, I, there's a few things going through my mind as you're talking, so I'm going to bring them up. But before I do, um, the thing I wanted to drive everyone's attention to is both of our Twitter handles and Instagram, well, my Instagram handle. Um, so my Instagram handle and Twitter handle are the same, and they're on the bottom of the uh, screen, the deck. And the other thing that you'll see is in the middle, there is a URL that I've put together with some of the resources that Chad and I discussed. Uh, and on that uh, URL, you can go there and you can actually see all those resources. You can also put your email address in and you'll get both um, this slide deck, my next presentation, which is about hashtag activism, <laughs> that nice. slide deck. And then you'll also get two worksheets to help you go through some of the items that we're discussing today. So 
all of that is on that URL. Please feel free to check that out. But uh, Chad, to the point that you were making just earlier about when you shared that story about your experience and how you were essentially being put into a box in that moment. Uh, this is something that I actually am going to be talking about in my next session, but it feels so great to just, it, it fits right in yeah. um, to what you just shared is there's a certain, there's a concept that's come out of public health called cultural humility. Mm, and yeah. I think cultural humility is one of the most powerful things that we as individuals can start to really um, think about because it's not just something that medical professionals use. It's something that we can use as individuals when we're interacting with others, uh, especially at a time where we're very quick to put people in a box. So cultural humility at the core is essentially saying, I'm willing to put my ego aside, my preconceived notions aside, and I'm willing to learn and understand how you identify yourself, how you feel that you fit into my your what is your identity and mm -hmm. that is something that i think is so powerful and something that i uh you know my i've really come to think about as such a powerful tool about how brands also talk about the artisans they work with so we often in fair trade because we're working with such a diverse population of individuals we're very quick to put people's experiences in a box and make blanket statements about the communities that we're working in and what i encourage you is to think about even taking this concept of a diversity wheel or really reading up on some concepts around cultural humility and doing activities such as this with the artisans you work with mm. because that is so powerful and that's really going to help you understand that narrative that they also have of themselves we can't always be writing people's stories there is a certain power dynamic there, yes. right? When we as outsiders go into a community saying, we're going to create jobs here mm. and this is how we're going to do it. And we're going to help you. And we're going to provide you with opportunities. While those are all very positive things at the surface, they are creating certain levels of power dynamics. So being thoughtful about that power dynamic and being cognizant of it and thinking of ways that you can almost address those dynamics and create more inclusive conversations is going to really help you as you start thinking about fair trade uh, as a business, fair trade as a practice that you want to keep moving forward. And then Manpreet, can I uh, add on something? Because you just brought up a really important point. So yeah. in the context of cultural humility, uh, a part of it is being very comfortable knowing our own privilege, right? Oh, uh, yeah. There's, there's different layers of it. Like, I'm very aware that I have the privilege of being able to work from home. I have mm -hmm. good friends and colleagues. Part of what I'm having a uh, day, we have a lot of colleagues who are unfortunately not being able to keep their jobs in the Y, and that's, yeah. getting, <clears throat> that's getting intense. Uh, the other thing is racial privilege. So I look Asian. Being from Hawaii, uh, obviously, I don't think I'm white. However, I was raised as a part of the racial majority being in Hawaii until I was 18. Mm -hmm. My good friend, Michael Farris, who works with us in the diversity inclusion team, he helped point out to me one day that and he basically said, Chad, I know you don't think you're white, but you move through this world as if you are. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about that. And I went, what the heck are you talking about? Come on now, I'm Asian, I'm Hawaii, look at me. And he mm -hmm. said, no, 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 you feel like you deserve the privilege of being at certain tables. You speak as if it's entitled. You mm -hmm. don't. You have not had to fight. You have not had to uh, sort of advocate for and be on the receiving end of inequity and marginalization the way that some others have. So oh, what yeah. you were saying is, Chad, so step yourself back. Give other people a chance to shine and watch it. I'm sharing that because in the context of fair trade, there is a little bit of sometimes a racial dynamic to it. Oh, yeah. There's sometimes an age dynamic to it. Fair trade is sometimes seen as something for young uh, Caucasian or white identified individuals to engage in. I remember being at one conference and joking, I don't know if you were in this session, a young woman talked, a, a, a young woman who appeared to be African American, stood up and talked about an instance where she was mistaken for someone who was from the overseas, uh, uh, overseas <laughs> business. And I've had that happen to me. <laughs> there, you want to share? Because this is exactly what <laughs> So I, yeah, no, I've had it happen to me. I've, um, it's really interesting. I 
uh, we didn't get a chance really to talk about our journeys with fair trade, but I, uh, I was actually invited to speak at another fair trade conference. And so I was one of the speakers there and I have, um, it was really interesting. My background's in tech. And so I've already dealt with the stereotypes of being a woman in tech. And, uh, you know, those, I was like, nothing could be worse than that. And then when I entered the fair trade sector, I realized that there is something that could be worse than that. And it's it's often, um, it's the first time in my life that I got put into a box noticeably uh, Mm. as a... um, as someone on the basis of my race. And I think chat, I, I feel the moment that you said that I was like, that feels like me. I've had the luxury and privilege. I'm, I've not had to struggle. I've come from a very stable household. I, I really have had a lot of privilege and it's, uh, but going to this conference, I was a speaker and uh, I had one of the attendees at the conference come up to me and ask me what producer group I work with in Mm -hmm. India. And uh, with the assumption that I was there as a representative, an artisan representative. And that was interesting. That was definitely interesting. I've also had comments around, well, Indian people don't date. So did you, how did you and your, like, were you and your husband in arranged marriage? We were not, we dated, we did the, we're your typical couple. Um, I got really big on that last one. Sorry, I couldn't fix my face there. Oh, it's good. It's good. Yeah, these are really interesting because um, I've realized oftentimes, and this is kind of just touching upon this concept of cultural humility and inclusion and uh, so forth, is that you know, we are very quick to want to assume that we know everything about a person on the basis of just looking at them. And the goal of this workshop and my hope, and I'm sure your hope as well, is that for everyone to step away and to leave this workshop and really think about what are some ways that I can make sure I check myself before I make assumptions about someone and also think about how you identify, right? We, we don't give ourselves also the opportunity to sit down and think about what are words that I want that to be associated with me? What are certain terms that I feel um, I identify with? For example, I don't identify as Indian, but I do identify as Punjabi because Mm -hmm. that is the region of India, which used to be part of Pakistan and India that my ancestors come from. That is what I identify as. And it's interesting. I've really had the chance and opportunity to dissect those layers of my identity. And I encourage everyone to take that time and space and do that as well, because that's a huge part of who we are as individuals. And I think space and grace is important. We, we know that nine times out of 10, there's no malicious intent, right? So if you're no. listening right now and you're feeling like maybe there's a lot of sort of, but how do I know? How, what do I do? You, you know what? Here's a really, really shocking thing. And we can all join each other in this. There is no way to move through our world today without offending someone. Oh, yeah. The goal, of course, and Jovi, you've heard me say this before, is to try really hard not to offend the same person two times in the same day in the same way. Because that's bad. Everything else? It's yeah. about grace. It's about, you know what? For example, I, I missed, messed up your name, Manpreet, the first time, right? Uh, what I hope I said, and if I didn't call me out on it, was, I am so sorry. How do I say your name? Great. Yeah. Thank you. And then I made that, da- uh, darn, I made darn sure I didn't do that again, at least in the same day. I, you were so gracious because I did it once more the next day. And you, I could feel your voice on the other side, like, oh, come on, Chad, seriously. But <laughs> that's the point of it. So we got to give each other grace and space and also recognize that, For some of us, we have the privilege, especially when it comes to moving in volunteer activities, like for most of us, fair trade is, of moving into that because we can. There are others who would like to move in those spaces but cannot, right? Yeah. Number number two, it's also important to recognize that um, if we are comfortable, what was the quote? If we're comfortable in like 80% of the social situations that we move in on a typical day, then we're in privilege. 
right? Mm -hmm. So for example, I live in Chicago. If you hear the noises outside, I live in the Boys Town neighborhood of Chicago. When I walk out the door in this neighborhood, I am privileged, right? Mm -hmm. When I travel across the country, as my job calls me to do, most times I'm going to places, sometimes, you know, right down the highway here in, in Indiana, where I am not. Mm -hmm. But I have the privilege of being able to come back to a neighborhood here in Chicago and then go back to Hawaii where I'm safe. Not, yeah. I feel safe, I should say. Not everyone has that. This applies to fair trade because sometimes we're asking the world of people, literally the world of people from other countries, and then expecting them to conform into our reality while we hold them up on a pedestal and say, oh, look at this amazing partnership that is actually benefiting everyone in the U.S. You're just helping us to feel good about yep. our social consciousness, even if the intention is not bad, mm -hmm. we have to be aware of that. And then here's the beauty, beauty of it, and I'll stop my rambling. We, yeah. it, we call ourselves out on it, we practice restorative practices, and we move through that. It's not about being righteous. It's not about having to be right. It's not about having to be correct. It's about mm -hmm. being gracious and kind and human and finding yeah. that, that connectivity and being honest with ourselves about why we're trying to do something. Because guess what? We all need hope right now. We all need inspiration right now. And when we get through this, because we will, we all will have a chance to invest our resources, whatever they may be in spaces that matter. I will tell you, I'm personally, after talking with Manpreet and all of our conversations preparing for this, I will be even more engaged in fair to actually email to see if I could be like you and get on a local board here. Because yeah. this is important. When we have less resources, we have to be more methodical about where we invest in. Most definitely. And I think that this is a great point to um, also just reflect as I'm not sure how many of you are uh, people who are just advocates for fair trade or business owners, fair trade business owners. But uh, if for, you are interested in starting a fair trade business or have a fair trade business, one of the things I strongly believe that we need to come to realize, and I was just in um, Zambia talking to a, a, a group there and I mentioned to the owners of the business, I said, we need to start realizing as a movement that we, the relationship that businesses and artisans have is mutually beneficial. It is not that we alone as the people in the West or as business owners um, are the ones helping the people that are creating the products. Without those artisans, you would have no business. Your business would not exist. And when we realize that and realize that relationship truly is mutual, we can start stepping back and thinking more thoughtfully about how we think about those relationships and how we foster uh, a more inclusive narrative for our brand, our mission, and our values. And so I want us to, we have a few things that we wanted to talk about. So let's talk a lot, a little bit about equality versus equity. So this was something that, um, Chad, you have sent over, and uh, the next one was one that I wanted to add and for us to talk about. But just going off of it, I would love for you to talk a little bit about equality versus equity, yep. and I will jump in with the next slide. Perfect. I'll make it real quick and experiential. Well, we can pretend it's experiential. So <laughs> all together. If we all were together, what I would ask you to do. Uh, Actually, no, I take that back. Even if we were together, you would just think about doing this because this could get all kinds of funky. You'll get why. So pretend we have an issue and we are all in a room. And the issue is that everyone in the room does not have shoes. Manpreet, I'm going to pick on you. If you don't mind sharing, what type, size, and gender shoe do you prefer to wear? <laughs> yes. I, um, what do I wear? Oh, I wear... Um, booties made by me solo and they are a size eight and they are female so a uh, lens of equality would mean that because that's the type size and gender shoe that you were we're going to give that to everyone on the webinar now mm -hmm. uh, or in the chat box let's make this interactive they're Joby, really you cute guys <laughs> and gals cute as they may be i'm going to ask the question in the chat box someone respond how would that type of shoe work for you Mm -hmm. If you could. Jovi, are we getting anything there? No, but I wear a size 10, so it wouldn't work for me. <laughs> and that's yeah. a perfect example. And I will tell you, everyone, including my husband, would probably uh, not be very happy if I tried to don those shoes either. So the point is, the difference between equality and equity, equality is we give everyone 
the size shoe because someone random has it. Equity is we give them the size shoe for their feet so they can mm -hmm. run or win a race. And you put that over the diversity will that we talked about uh, in the context of intersectionality. For example, I'm a gay Asian male, 30 something years old, who is living in Chicago. Because of that, there are certain privileges that I have that allow me to have to get less boxes in this diagram in terms of supports to achieve or receive the opportunities that I need to survive and thrive. Someone who may have less privilege than me would need more boxes of support. Someone would, who would have more privilege than me would need even fewer uh, mm -hmm. boxes of support, if I'm saying that correctly. So equity versus equality. We think they're interchangeably. They are not. Think about Manpreet shoes and Jovi trying to wear them. The next time you think about the difference between those <laughs> shoes. Next yeah. Time. So taking it a step further, let's talk about equality versus equity versus justice. So this is something that I feel is a little newer in regards to concept as people are perceiving it, conceiving it, and coming to their own terms with it. And so I um, couldn't find the, you know, the tree does not work in this situation, but a fence does. So uh, as you'll see on this slide, that the thing that we define as justice is that the cause of the inequality is addressed. And this is something that is very, can be a little controversial in some ways because there's so much systemic inequality that it's really hard. It's not as easy as a fence right? We can't easily change it. And this is where some of those conversations around the diversity wheel, cultural humility, are our ways of just kind of picking at it and really reaching this point of social justice in some way is how do we start approaching justice uh, is by really first coming to terms, acknowledging our own privilege, acknowledging that everyone has a unique perspective and then being an, being open and humbled enough and putting our ego aside and asking people questions. I think for me, when it comes to justice and this idea of justice, the number one way we'll get there or we will even reach a closer point. We're not, I think justice is a moving bull, like target. It changes. And, but at the same time, uh, the way that I think as a co community, we can get closer to reaching these points is when we start actually having these conversations, getting uncomfortable, right? It was um, typically when someone would mispronounce my name, I would let it go. And it's taken me some time and uh, it, it really takes effort and energy, to be honest, on my end to be constantly okay with correcting. And, but at the same time, I've also realized that that is my unique identity. That is who I am. That is who I, uh, that is what, if there's one thing that classifies me, it's my name and I will put the effort for that. And so when it comes to this idea of justice, the big thing that I really encourage each of us to think about is what are, and bringing it back to fair trade real quick here, is what are the social problems I am trying to address with my business? And oftentimes you'll notice this um, in the URL at the bottom, there's a concept of heropreneurship, right? So it's this idea that as social entrepreneurs, this demand for being a social entrepreneur increases. So does our uh, almost uh, conception of being the hero of the story. We're, we want to talk about what we are doing, the impact we are making. Yeah. And I really encourage you to step back from that and truly understand what the gaps are when it comes to the problems you are trying to solve and what are the gaps in the social system that you're trying to solve because we can very blindly try to say this is a poverty issue i want to uh, address poverty but poverty is not something that can quickly be addressed by putting some throwing jobs at it it is a systemic issue and it needs nurturing and it needs thought and it needs to be addressed truly more systemically versus simply throwing uh, a business at it. 
And if I can um, just build on that, and we are really jiving, Manpreet. I love our, our flow here. So yeah. some of you may have seen a version of this that didn't have that sort of see-through fence there, right? Mm-hmm. And I just want to call out what's important about the diagram that Manpreet just walked us through. Mm-hmm. We can't ignore the barriers that are there. Mm-hmm. We can't, anybody know the matrix, right? There is no spoon. This is not, a, there is no barrier. There is a barrier. It's a matter of being able to see through it and acknowledge it. Um, As we think about that, we have to be cautious because sometimes those with privilege will think it's possible for there to be no gated fence there. And Mm -hmm. that's not a thing, right? We sometimes uh, default to the pull yourself up by the bootstraps concept, even Mm -hmm. with good intentions, especially in fair trade, right? Mm -hmm. And we have to realize we have to be able to acknowledge and call out something that's there so that we can work through it hypothetically People can see the fence, they could climb over it, but they can't just walk through it. Mm -hmm. Follow me? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And it sounds like we have a question over here. Awesome. Do you you mind reading the question out to us, Jovi? In a time of crisis, like the health and economic crisis we are currently facing with uh, Corona, how many people... How can people who hold more privilege support those who have less and were already more marginalized before the crisis? Okay. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Very heavy, very loaded. Uh, yeah. We'll can do I our best. On that? Or Manfred, did you want to, sorry. Um, give me a second to think about it. There's, so the, the reality is that this is, I've been track. I've noticed on Instagram and on Twitter that there's a lot of local initiatives happening within communities to address how people are being affected by uh, COVID. And I, I can definitely share an example of um, an economic economic situation. So a friend of mine actually just lost her job on last Friday because of COVID. And she was in a situation where for her, she was like, this could be, people are not hiring. And I don't know how long this is going to keep going. What do I do? And she did have the privilege of having, she does have the privilege of having a lot of uh, support around her. And so she was able to quickly secure an interview within 72 hours. Oh, wow. Amazing. Right. And that to me is an example of not necessarily someone is, is an example of someone who is navigating the crisis with privilege. Now at the same time, that is not going to be the case for a lot of the people who are working in small boutiques or working in stores or working at coffee shops, any of the, that is not going to be their situation. And I personally have been trying to figure it out myself. I don't have an answer. Uh, if, if I can share some examples, my building yeah. up hearing. So um, I'm just pausing to think, and these are real world, but I will not mention the city to, to protect confidentiality. Mm-hmm. Um, as some wise have closed, some CEOs have literally taken up to a hundred percent pay cuts so they can keep their staff employed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, two good friends of mine got furloughed in different cities today. Uh, and I realized I have the privilege. So my first text to them, what do you need? Do you need a loan? Do you need me to pay you something? I know I have the privilege. My husband would probably kill me if he heard me saying that, but it is what we do when we can do. And even all of that is still privilege, right? Um, the Chinese restaurant that we ordered from, I'm going to get sorry, a little emotional because everything is all hard sometimes. Um, they were already exper- experiencing anti-East Asian sentiment, right? People called, somebody called the lady the Chinese virus or whatever the hell it was. Mm-hmm. So I want to make sure that we order delivery. I want to make sure that we keep them in business, but because that's a privilege that I have and I need to be responsible with that. At the same time, even that restaurant still has privilege, right? There's layers to it when you go all the way down. Oh, yeah. There are, I think, Manpreet, you and I and Jovi, we're all empathetic people we can't even begin to process the impact that COVID is going to have on people. What we can do is recognize that we have to have a lens of collectivism and be able to, and this is the next slide I know that's up there. So perfect timing. And here's this for an emotional segue, really looking at how we approach uh, collectivism 
in a time when individualism is not going to get us through, right? Like yeah. the slide says, I mean, sorry, I'm stealing your thing, but this is a perfect way to, to answer the question that was posed. Mm -hmm. Colonialization continues to influence society's assumptions that people without privilege or minorities need saving. Yeah. And if we are going to help, if we are going to truly, as the question said, in, time, <clears throat> in times of crisis, um, support those who have less and are already marginalized, it is meeting them where they are. It is not approaching from a context of pity. It is saying, yeah. what can I do? What do you need? Do you need me to shut up and stop texting me? All right, you got that. Exactly. If else, I am here. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. And I think that that's the thing is we often think we... So I'm going to backtrack outside of COVID for a moment because Please. I think it's a very emotional thing for all of us right, right. now. So I want to give another example. Thank so... You. Uh, there is an author, um, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name, so apologies, uh, but her first name is Mona. She wrote a book named, I have it over there, it's called Hyman <laughs> and Hijabs, so I just saw it, uh, and she was here speaking in, I'm, I'm in Seattle, everyone, just so everyone knows, and she was here speaking a few years in Seattle, and she spoke about her book and her journey as a Muslim woman with the hijab. Hmm. And uh, Seattle is a pretty white city, is the reality. Uh, and so most of the people in the room were not people of color. They were white. And one of the women uh, stood up and asked her a question saying, you know, when I see a Muslim woman wearing a hijab, I just want to ask her, like, um, I feel really bad for you. Like, are you being oppressed? And how, what can I do for that woman? Like when I see a woman wearing a hijab, walking around, what is something I can do for her? And Mona very tactfully responded, you can leave her alone. And that's in some ways something that we need to also think about when it comes to uh, COVID, mm -hmm. right? So the thing is, we often think that, oh my goodness, I need to help you right away. And we go in with this mindset of, I am going to provide you with help. But I love, Chad, that you said, we need to also be able to ask people, what do you need? Yeah. Do you need something? What can I, is there something I can do? How can I best support you? And this is something that I think is, it comes with practice, right? Because we humans are great people. We want to be helpful. We want to, um, we're, we're not going to be rude. We're not going to shut people out. But this is one of those moments where it's really, it's important for us to be thoughtful about asking not what can I do for you, but how can I support you? And just that change in language is so it really helps even out that playing field and that power dynamic. So going into this slide a little bit, and just this point is, uh, I do a lot of work around ethical storytelling for fair trade and how to tell more inclusive brand narratives. And the thing that I really tell people is, for me, the reason I'm doing the work I'm doing is I feel it's time we de decolonize sustainability yes. and we decolonize wealth. And for me, I find that the thing I've realized is we often think that colonization is something of the past, but it exists. It exists in the way power dynamics still play out. It exists in the reason why fair skin is more admir admirable in many uh, communities of color. Uh, one of the most popular skin creams in India is called Fair and Lovely. So uh, it just gives you a perspective of colonization still exists. It's built into our mindsets. And it really does continue to influence the way societies assume the role of people of color or minorities. And um, the idea that because there is col this idea of being a person of color, because you're a person of color, you need to be saved, or that you need help, or you need support. And that dynamic is really harmful. Because as we keep thinking that I, oftentimes this level of I have privilege, 
we don't realize often the layers of privilege that exist, right? Chad, you and I might have privilege and my, I'm going to share a personal example. So my husband, I hope he's okay with this now that I think about it, but I'm sure he will be. Um, <laughs> so my husband is uh, a physician. He's a physician in the city of Seattle right now. And he is, um, he's a very brilliant man. Um, and he, but he wears a turban and his experience, even as a physician wearing a turban, one of my, one of his stories that's really interesting to me is he went to go grab coffee outside his clinic and someone else was, or he went to grab a subway, something. And someone else came in to the shop and said, you look a lot like my taxi driver. Mm. And, wow. and this is him just outside his clinic that he works at. And the idea is that, oh, you're, you're a great doctor for, for being the way you are, right? Those are common things. And he experiences, I have the privilege, I don't get those comments because I outwardly don't look like, I don't look different. I have, I can put my hair up, I, that's it. But my husband wears a turban. He outwardly does look different. And he does get comments where he does have to navigate through society looking very different than everyone else. He has a beard, he has a turban. And that is a, that actually made me realize my privilege over what his experience is. And we're very similar. And I think we are really playing off of each other well here. You know, I think when we talk about, um, being aware of our privilege and how it manifests differently for your husband in this clinic than it does right outside the door, for example. Mm -hmm. And also the concept that you expertly elevated earlier, Manpri, about um, sort of asking permission. Let's apply that to fair trade, right? In the context of fair trade, we need to be able to ask, how can we help you? How can we be a best support? Well, that's how we market something. Well, that's how we frame an email. Well, that's how we even organize things on a table. If we are at a display at a, at a conference, Joe, you might've been there when that happened too. There's this weird dynamic between two people trying to organize a table for the same artisan. The artisan and somebody was trying to tell them how to organize it. I was like, I almost felt like, listen, <laughs> Can, and, and, and I say this with love, but I wanted to say to the individual, could you please take your privileged self and just step back a bit? Because if you could see how it looked, you wouldn't like it. And I felt so bad for both of them but I had my Y logo on C and I couldn't like interject on that. So we just have to be aware of that. The yeah. other thing is, you know, whether it's a turban or whether it is our skin color or whether it's anything exactly, you read my mind. Uh, I think one of the things that we really want to be mindful of is how we, um, I'm going to ask if we can go back to just one thing for one second. Yeah, this Sorry. one or yeah. the previous? This one. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Just how we operationalize this, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not just touchy feely kumbaya. We love the world. There is a technical side to this. Think about whatever the operations of whatever you do are. If you're a student, how does your fair trade organization work? If you're a business owner, what business, what are the main lines of your business? How do you do whatever it is that you do? If you're a practitioner at a hospital, if you're a professor, what do you do? What are the policies, practices, and procedures that govern and guide everything that you do? And then ask yourself one question. Are those policies, practices, and procedures aligned with your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Mm -hmm. Yes, no. And, okay, I lied, two questions. Who are you asking that to? Do you mm -hmm. have an echo chamber? Is it people that are gonna say, yes, you are awesome, we good, nothing, to, nothing has to change. Or is it people that are gonna really challenge you and say, you know what, you think you're inclusive, but of course you are, because you ask the same question to the same people the same way every year, and you get nice 80% customer service satisfaction. Yay, you as opposed to stirring it up and really asking. It's not easy to have someone tell you, you know what, actually, what you thought was working for three generations of community members is now not working, you're changing yeah. it. The way you actually, yeah, go ahead. I do wanna jump in here yeah. because I think one of the things that you mentioned is having a policy around diversity, equity, exactly. inclusion, and most businesses don't. Just because you're a fair trade business and you're working with community artists and communities doesn't mean that that automatically makes you a diverse business. Yes. That doesn't automatically make you an inclusive business. It is important yes. to take the time, take the space yes. and actually think about what is our commitment to diversity and inclusion? Because if you don't mind, I would love to jump to the next slide for yep. just a second. Um, because 
what we realize, and this is something that I'm going to be talking more about in my next presentation, but it just fits beautifully here, is representation cannot only be, diversity representation cannot be just the artisans you work with. Yes. It has to be at every layer of your business. That is not diversity if only the old all the diversity in your team is at the level of the artisan. Diversity is when it's built into each layer of your business, your executive team, your teams on in the states, your teams on the grounds. It should be everywhere. You should be being thoughtful about representation. Your models. Yes. Like, I mean, I am so tired. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to rant just for a second. <laughs> I am so tired. <laughs> and this is very common, right? This is a, this is very common across ethical, sustainable, fair trade businesses where we live in a very visual era. Yes. We live in an era where social media really does drive how we convey our brands. And I am very tired of seeing brands sharing photos where the only people of color that show up in their feed are their artisans and no one else. And the models are not, do not look like the artisans. At some point we need to realize if we're really committed to diversity and inclusion, that power, the person of color, the communities that you're working with can also be models. Yeah. Your products can be also used by them. And that's going to be so much more impactful and really creating that policy and giving it the space is critical. We need to recognize that relationships are mutually beneficial and really work as a community. We can't, fair trade cannot operate as outsiders going into a community and trying to create a business. You have to really engage the people there and really understand the ecosystem you're working in. And if I can jump in on that. And so, yeah. I know we're going to work through all these five key concepts, but if we look at language at the bottom of this slide, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just kind of be blunt. Being woke in one area, if woke is even still a thing, does not equate to being woke in all areas, right? Oh, yeah. One of the most dangerous things, and I say dangerous intentionally in DEI, is making the assumption that because someone's a person of color, they won't also have some racial prejudice, oh, right? Yeah. Or, and this is a funny one, obviously, I know I'm flying the gay flag all over, but me being a gay man does not mean I have the first inkling of what it means to be a gay black man. I don't know. I only know, I actually don't even know what it means to be a gay Asian man. I know what it means to be Chad, this one, <laughs> the one person, right? And so we have to recognize, though, that um, the world, going back to the concepts in Edgar Villanueva's Decolonizing Wealth, when we break through, when someone of a marginalized, disenfranchised, oppressed population breaks through, we have a responsibility to make sure that we recognize the, uh, the words that we say will carry or be more blunt, right? Mm -hmm. If I, as an Asian, a Asian male, if I screw up in the role that I have, I am very clear and very aware that that may hinder someone who looks and identifies like me from having the same role again, right? Mm -hmm. Because we recognize that if we have layers of oppressed intersectionality, it makes it that much harder sometimes for us to make it. So, Here's what I'm suggesting for everyone that's in on this meeting or in this meeting. It's not that we have to be perfect, but we do need to be aware of the spaces where we have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. I know that one of my soft spots or one of my Achilles heel is faith because I've experienced so many challenges with not only Christianity, but so many faiths of being uh, almost an excommunicate. That's not what I meant to say <laughs> of being pushed out or marginalized or dehumanized. When someone asks if they can pray for me, sometimes my reaction is really pray what exactly? right? Yeah. That's something I recognize as a bias for me that I need to work on. Um, the other is a patriarchy, right? When someone talks down to me, I don't like being called son. And I know that applies to many of us. I don't like being told, oh, you look so much younger than you are. That, <laughs> that may become a compliment later, but not when I'm a national executive and I still get mixed up for the intern or the IT dude or the person delivering Chinese food. This is not a compliment. So mm -hmm. making sure of that. And then the next thing, going back to context, understand the cultural norms of the community that you're working in. We don't get to descend in a community and decide, because I'm here, everything's going to change. Here's a real story. I'm from Hawaii. I went to New York City. I'm on Greek and I'll stop rambling. My boss in my first performance review goes, Chad, I need to tell you something. I go, yes. He goes, did you think that all of New York City was going to alter our cultural norms because you arrived? And I went, oh, 
darn, okay, you just completely held my feet to the fire. No, I did not. I will adjust. Because at that time I was saying, well, you all are too rude. You all talk too fast. Nobody gives time for talking story like we do in Hawaii. I literally was expecting like the city of New York to change because chat arrived. What kind of crazy stuff was that? So content yeah. is key. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I do want to go back. I know I keep talking about language and terms. And one of the ones that we see most, the most often used word in fair trade is empower. This idea of empowerment, that I am empowering this community or we are empowering this community. And I really encourage you, if that is a word that you use to describe your business, to step back and think about it. Because the reality is that you are probably not empowering anyone. You're providing opportunities and people are empowering themselves. And we need to really acknowledge it and recognize that, right? Other words that we often use is voice to the voiceless. I, I don't like using that phrase. I don't think that that is a, I think that it's an oversimplification of something that's very complex that's trying to be conveyed. And I used to use that phrase. Right. And I've, I've used the word empowered. I've used the word voice to the voiceless. I'm not saying that any of us are perfect. And I think it's all about, I really, I know we're coming closer to the end. So I really do want us to just recognize the fact that this is a journey, right? We will offend other people along the way. It is a journey. But if you can just start with, this is, uh, these are just a few points for you to get thinking about when it comes to fair trade and your business or your passion for fair trade or the businesses that you decide that you want to support, if you can start thinking in this context, it's going to really help you evaluate and think about why you're doing what you're doing and how you convey it to your consumers and to the people within your team and the artisans you're working with and everyone else in between. It's really important for us to be thoughtful. And this is just designed to be a framework to help you get thinking about those aspects. So we do have um, a, a little slide at the end to help you think about moving forward how can you advocate for change, right? And I think the first thing that we really uh, believe when we were talking and preparing for today and we realized that clicked for both of us is being able to recognize, acknowledge, and address power dynamics. Power dynamics, we've talked about racial power dynamics. We've talked about uh economic power dynamics, but there's so many layers to those um, that it's really important to be thoughtful about that, right? Oftentimes as businesses working in the West with artisan groups, um, oftentimes in Asia or Africa, the assumption is that uh, within the artisan group, everyone is the same, but we need to also recognize that there's layers of power dynamics within those artisan groups as well. The people who are leading the group versus the artisans themselves have a power dynamic at play that's often ignored. So being willing to acknowledge that and address it is very important. Just because the leader of the group says you have the uh, permission to share the story of an artisan doesn't mean that that is permission and informed consent. The other thing is purchase, um, leveraging your purchasing power. This is extremely critical, I think, especially right now, right? We're living in a time where, uh, you know, a few of my clients have had to put a hold on even their pro our projects together because of the economic situa situation that is currently happening for so many small businesses. And that's going to be even worse for people who are typically considered marginalized, right? And so I really do encourage you to leverage your purchasing power, um, not just at this time, but even moving forward. 
And finally, really thinking and changing that narrative. This is something that I feel very, very passionately about is make sure you start addressing your savior language if there, and most likely we all use it, it exists. Yes. So address savior language um, and really think about how you communicate impact, right? And this comes back to the why. Why do you feel so inclined to buy fair trade products? Why do you want to buy socially conscious products? Also realizing at that point that you have a privilege to be able to afford those products, right? Because there is, they are more expensive and not passing judgment on someone who probably can't afford to buy something that is made ethically because they are trying to live paycheck to paycheck. So being able to think about that privilege and then also think about how you talk and communicate impact is really important. Anything you'd like to add? I'm just, I'm, I'm actually wondering, I, that was wonderful. I actually feel like maybe we can just pause and ask if there's any questions or thoughts. Because, yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, obviously Manpreet is the cooler of the two of us and the much no, no. So I just, uh, one of the things that's a privilege of being involved with fair trade is just the number of cool people. Jolie, Montpreet are just a few of them. I mean, I was thinking about, so I'm going to share a quick story. I'll, most of you probably know Billy and Kylie because they're the ones that organize all this. The reason that I even became curious about fair trade was because Billy and I met at a conference uh, for a nonprofit leadership Alliance conference. I can't even remember what the instance was. I just remember Billy inserting himself and using his cisgender, heterosexual, white male privilege on my behalf and stepping in in a way that was powerful. I think I remember thinking, okay, you cool. Now, what do you do again? And, yeah. and so I don't want to undervalue, whether it's individually, organizationally, societally, the importance that all of us recognize we all have some privilege. Mm -hmm. We all have a seat at some table that someone else doesn't have a seat at. And there's a table somewhere that all of us don't have a seat at, even uh, cisgender, heterosexual, white, uh, Christian, whatever men. If you are in the majority, there's still seats that you may not have. We are united in knowing what it feels like to be othered. That's what bonds us. And if we can find that commonality through socially conscious opportunities that promote awareness and empathy and understanding and global citizenry like fair trade, then it's more than just one of us holding up our honesty and saying, I rock, this is cool. It's the relationships, it's the connectivity. It's really recognizing what do I know? Yeah. And what do I only think I know? And then how can I dive deeper? And like you just said, be even more, and I'm challenging myself after all this craziness. And Manpreet, we're going to be friends hopefully long beyond just this webinar. Oh, yes. Honorable. Like, ask me, hey, Chad, that thing that you just posted on Instagram, because my Instagram handle is the same as Twitter, same as you. So was that, <laughs> did you even know where that was made? What's up with that? Why are you doing that? Let's hold each other accountable in the yeah. new reality. Because sadly, or unfortunately, or whatever you want to call it, every dollar we spend is going to have that much more impact now oh, yeah. and in the future. And yeah. Um, yeah. So quick question. Sorry. I, I said I want to answer, answer them and I just kept, talk, kept on talking. <laughs> Well, we didn't have anyone post any additional questions, but I would just like to say that I appreciate both of you. I was over here shaking my head and clapping and <laughs> 100%. And I really hope that people take the time to really think about what our speakers spoke about and really um, digest it, you know, go deeper. Let's not just sit on the surface and do things that make us comfortable. Yes. Really go deeper and really, you know, be able to look at yourself, myself, and, you know, just try better. Yeah. You know, I think try better I and be. reach out for help, right? Manpreet, I don't mean to talk, speak for you. I think both of us would be willing to oh, yeah. support and service, right? I mean. Most definitely. I mean, that we... This is obviously something we're all passionate about. Yes. And the fact that you're even here attending yes. this conversation, even if you don't have questions, the fact that you're taking the time to attend this conversation means that you care. And I, and I, we all both appreciate you being here with us. And if you do have follow-up questions, we, our contact information is up. Also, if you want the slide decks, additional resources, it's literally a page of everything that I could, I got very excited. 
<laughs> I, I got excited and I made it a thing. <laughs> that's what social isolation does to you. So <laughs> that's how I'm coping. Um, but basically made a whole page, uh, artistcitizenry.com slash FTConf2020. Wow. Um, yeah. And it is all resources and some book recommendations I have. There's oh. more book recommendations. I'm just going to start adding things to it. It's going to be a work in progress. But uh, I messaged Chad yesterday. I was like, do you have things you want me to add? And he's like, I'm really in the middle of things, but these were some ideas. And I was like, you know what? This is great. I'm just going to keep going. This I love this. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I have to just give credit. Manpreet put together, as you can tell, like 90% of this. I'm just along for the ride. Yeah, and, wow. I, I do encourage, I mean, check out what Manpreet does. Engage uh, with her and everything. And, and really just, I think, um, we all are lucky, right, to have things like fair trade to pour ourselves into. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will say, Manpreet, just publicly, I can't tell you how much it means to have. So just in transparency, like I texted Manpreet earlier today that I, I was really having a tough day. And her response was, I'm here for you as an ally or anything that you need and I knew if I needed to step back from this you just carry it and we don't even we've never even met that's the bonds of humanity that fair trade created long before COVID I'll be blunt and yeah. will continue to strengthen and deepen long after and oh yeah awesome. most definitely we most do definitely. have a question um someone wants to know if you can share the link to the that resource yeah uh can, should I put it into the group chat here or do you do you want to uh put it jovi into the group chat to everyone what's the best way it's right here it's on the screen artofcitizenry.com slash ft conf 2020 okay i will add it um after to the discussion board for this group chat and uh, please don't forget, this video will be available for the next 30 days so anyone can replay it. And after that, we will be posting the sessions on the YouTube. Yeah. Well, will you know, I didn't read that in the email. All righty then. It's not going to self-destruct after everyone. No. All right. <laughs> I was hoping it would. No, just, oh. Wait, don't, don't put that in the recording. That's already in there now. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, I think that that's all for us. Does that sound right? Yep. Awesome. It was so nice having all of you join us. Thank you so much. Please stay healthy and safe. Yes. All the best. And Manpreet and Jovi, you all are amazing. Uh, and from, from my end, anything I can ever do for the two of you or anyone else on the line at your service, be well, be safe, and let's keep on trying to change the world. Thank you. It was lovely meeting all of you.